Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. Tonight we are coming to you, to you from the Coloma Community Center. If you hear some background noise, that is the reason. All right, we're here on the show. Um, James, I hear that you're running for uh, Assembly District 7. Yep, we just made it. We just got our signatures done, turned in. We qualified, we're officially qualified on the ballot. So if people write my name in Assembly District 7, if they write James Just on the ballot, they will be, it will be counted. Okay, who, who are you running against? I built Kevin McCarty is, is the current incumbent and, and he was running unopposed. And so, you know, it's as soon as the first of the year, actually, I decided, no, I'm not going to do it. No, I'm not going to run. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But I was watching so many of my fellow gig workers have their economies and be hurting that I, with nobody else running, I was like, oh, man, I almost felt like I had to. You know, there was, I get, I have a opportunity that other people in my economic sphere don't have. So I figured Yeah, I mean, I, especially since the guy's unopposed. I, I mean, I'm surprised nobody else, why is nobody else jumping up to this plane? Why is nobody else uh, on the ballot? Well, in this particular district, it's a heavily Democrat district, mm -hmm. and so Republicans simply don't want to spend the resources on it when they have competitive districts that they would like to spend the resources in. Mm -hmm. And so it's left up to people like me or other community activists to kind of try to step up and give some kind of voice to people who aren't being heard. And so that's kind of what we were trying to do. Okay, okay, okay. Is there, anybody, is there any other write-in candidates? Um, currently, no, um, but you know, they can always change. They have till the 18th of February, and so they, they might sneak in, but you know, we're, 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 we're right now, you, you are officially the o only opposition to this. Uh, officially, if I vote for myself, I get onto the November ballot, yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so all you do is have to vote for yourself. Okay, okay. And, and it's all, beca all because of all the restrictions and, you know, of, of the, uh, you know, the, the AB5 that, that's affect, affecting the, the uh, gig economy, and I know that that's a major issue for you. Well, AB5 is kind of what pushed me over the, the edge. I've, I had been considering this kind of a run for a long time, but come, what is it, 30, January 1st, I was, no, I'm not going to do it, no, I'm mm -hmm. not going to do it. But then I was listening to, um, the, what was her name? Gonzalez, the lady who sponsored AB5, and she was talking about how great of a bill it was and how it was helping people, and I'm going, I'm watching my communities just disintegrate in front of my eyes. Half the people having to leave to go off and work in jobs that they didn't want or, or in industries that they didn't want to do. I had, there was other young lady, she has a special needs son, he's autistic. And so she was out, she does various gig work. So she, when she can, so she can go out and she can work for two hours, then come home and, or if her son's having a bad day, she can not work, go to work. She doesn't have to explain it to anybody. She can just not work that day. She doesn't have to explain to a boss. She doesn't have to tell anybody. She doesn't have to go through the embarrassment and the hassle. You know, and all that freedom, that, the flexibility and freedom that many of us have had is now gone. I mean, yeah, because now that, uh, that they're making everybody employees, that means they can be fired now. Yes. Uh, or, or I mean, they can still be, be given up a contract, but now they can put more stringent uh, requirements to fire somebody. No, you could be fired before. Well, you were deactivated. Well, you could be deactivated. deactivated. Uh, but but as far as far as the, the flex, they can they can because if, if you're an employee, you're going to have a higher expectation. Yes. Um, you know, at least as 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 a, someone who employs people, I, I, anybody who works for me versus a contractor. If you're if you're my employee, I have a higher expectation than if you're just a contractor that I'm, that I'm hiring and and paying to get the job done. Well, I don't even necessarily if it's a higher standard. As an as a contractor, you have standards you must meet, right? If you don't meet the standards, you get deactivated from the platform. And so, but but the algorithm takes care of that. There's there's no personalities involved. There's no person you have to talk to. And if you have you know personal issues like I can't work this week because I hurt my ankle, you don't have to explain that to a boss. You just don't turn on the app, right? Yeah. There's there's no, or you can go on vacation if you want to. You can go to a political convention and take a few days off. You can run for office, and so you're not at work at the regular hours <laughs> as you normally yeah, would. Yeah, I think be. that's the best way to uh, you know, <laughs> run for office. You'd be an Uber driver, and everyone you, you everyone that you're uh, doing rides for, you can just get. Give your business card your flyer. <laughs> and, and, and also we focus. I've, I've seen someone do that before, actually. Yeah, well, and we focus a lot on Uber drivers, but it's a lot more than just Uber drivers. It was truckers and journalists and uh, the ladies who do um, sign language. We, we, I didn't even realize that the, the people who do sign language at the courts and things, they are also affected by this. And so there's it's a whole string of people. They didn't think it through and they, they didn't think it through. They didn't talk to individuals. They talked to groups. And this is, this is kind of the funny thing. They're, they're down here in the state, state capitol just today talking to various groups about redoing AB5, but they're still not talking to individual drivers. They're not talking to individual Uber drivers. They're not talking to individual Lyft drivers. They're not talking to individual journalists. They're talking to journalist groups and their driver groups. And, 
But these things all have their own agendas. And those of us who are individuals, we also have our own agendas. But because the politicians don't even attempt to talk to us, we don't get heard. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that really is going to affect people. I mean, a lot of people depend on that. Um, and outside of that, you're gonna, you kind of need to have a safety net and stuff. And I know you always talk a lot about having a, a family safety net. What, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, in the old days, the reason you would buy a house is so you could pass it on to your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, and that created a, fa a safety net. So when someone down the road had trouble, they had some place to go, right? There was some, something to catch you them. You weren't homeless. You weren't homeless. You had, a, you had a, you know, the uncle in the attic or, or the, you know, the, the basement. The, someone who had uh, emotional problems would live in grandma's basement. Well, and that way they weren't being used in the social safety net, right? The families were taking care of them, and so the social safety net had more resources to take care of those people who didn't have the family safety net. But what we have done recently is we have used households, houses. We no longer buy a house to pass it on to our, to our grandchildren. We, pat, we buy a house so we can sell it and move to Florida or sell it to, to move on to a bigger house. It's all, it's all kind of a crass economic tool rather than the emotional tool that it used to be. Because mm -hmm. my grandfather, I mean, I use myself as an example because I am the luckiest person alive. I get to live in a, in a house my grandfather literally built brick by brick. My grandma wouldn't marry him unless he, built a, unless he had a house, and so he literally built her a house. <laughs> and I get to live in that house, and so I, and that house protected me. When my family fell apart and life fell apart and I was near homeless in San Diego on the streets of San Diego, my family brought me back, they set me up in this house and I was able to rebuild my life and now where I'm at the point where I get to sit here and, and have this discussion with you about how do we move forward, how do we create safety nets. It's that family safety net that saved me and, ma and my family and my children and now I'm sitting here watching my own children having to move to Pennsylvania because California can't, you can't, you can't get a start in California anymore. And if, and if we have this type of advantage, if someone with this type of advantage can't do it, you know, how, how is an average person, how is a person from the, down the street in, in, my, you know, in my neighborhood who lives in the, in the ghetto instead of at the edge of the ghetto mm -hmm. like I do, how are they supposed to do it? They can't even get the, enough resources together to move to Pennsylvania. And so how are they supposed to get a foot up? How are they supposed to be able to? Yeah, and, and that, that, that kind of ties into you know, economic development. What is your plan a, a, as a candidate to uh, kind of spark up that economic development uh, in your area? Because, uh, I mean, obviously we want to fix it, but we don't want everyone to, uh, to leave. But, uh, do you, I mean, do you have a contingent plan to, to you know, help spark that and, and you know, stop people from leaving? Well, there are a few. I mean, first things you can do is you can get the government out the way. There, in my neighborhood, there was a, a apartment development with a, they wanted to build a three-story apartment building with retail underneath. And there's some issues with that, but they can't even start building it for a year. It's going to take a year, at least, at best, to get through the design proposals and, and, and get through all the various government departments and get approvals. Well, that's a problem, right? If it takes a year, that means it's money. That means that takes money. And that means small developers are essentially out of the system. A small developer can't wait a year to start building. They, can, they have to buy the property and get building within a month because they need that, that building done so they can start getting income or so they can sell it. Yeah. So, they, yeah, so small developers can't do it. So only big developers actually are at the point where they can actually now operate in the system. Yeah, I mean, California really is becoming the, uh, unless you have a big business, you can't really have a small business here. And they're, I mean, they're like we just talked about it earlier. They, AB, AB5, you know, you, no, there's no small businesses, it's, it's all yeah. big businesses. Yeah, and, and they kind of deliberately, and I don't want to say deliberately do it, they've accidentally created this system where these big businesses are the only ones who can compete. And in neighborhoods like mine, it's organically developed. There was no major developer, so in my, in my street, there's seven houses on my street, there are four different styles, right? And <laughs> there's no single developer. It's a wonderful neighborhood to live in, it's, it's beautiful. And we don't get that anymore because everything now has to go through the city planning department. And but that takes time, time is money. And then another thing we can do is like in my neighborhood, there's a Stockton Boulevard corridor and it's, it's been a disaster for a long time. And why, was, why don't we have like a marijuana development zone so we can bring in marijuana processing facilities and ha warehousing and, and grows. And you're not gonna add anything, it's the ghetto. You can't, bringing in economic developments is not gonna hurt the ghetto. <laughs> right? <laughs> you, can't, you can't hurt it anymore, it's already at. Bringing in walkable jobs that pay well is a good thing for, for rough neighborhoods. And so in places like Del Paso Heights or Oak Park and these kind of neighborhoods, this is where these kind of developments should go. You don't want to, no, you don't want to put them in the fabulous 40s or, or in down in Midtown. You, you don't. But in areas where they're needed and where the people need walkable jobs, those are the kind of areas we want to put these kind of development in. And there's lots of money. It's a, it's, a ground, it's a ground floor industry. And so you can actually get something in there. You can get in there with lower development, with 
energetic people, and, and you can actually start to create some economic development in, these, in our community. And that will help you know, with our homeless problem. We've got a big, huge homeless problem in the same area. And you know, if, if you can get some economic development, then you can get some those homeless people some jobs, and you can get them off the street. Because most of these homeless, are, they're not this, what we think of when we think of homeless now. You know, we think of the traditional homeless person from 30 years ago where they kind of chose to be homeless or they were so broken as a human being that they can't get themselves back up. And so we think of that as the homeless problem. But today's homelessness problem isn't just that anymore. It's, it's people who with jobs and with careers and who simply can't afford to live in California. And we've pushed them. We've deliberately pushed them out onto the streets. And I've just been breaking my heart. We, in my neighborhood, we closed some of these low-end motels and then all these people now are on the streets. And I, I, I literally, I'm walking down and go, why did we close all these low-end motels when we had no place for these people to go? The, you know, these motels, they said these motels were causing a blight, but now we have tents and tarps lined on the streets. And, well, what's more of a blight? People living in, in, in run-down motels yeah. or people living on the streets? There's <laughs> no, you're making our hotels look bad, so we're going to put you in the streets. <laughs> yeah, it made no sense. The city, city makes way more sense, right? <laughs> yeah. And you go, oh, well, we'll reach out to them. We'll, we'll get them services. Well, no, your services don't work. And many of them don't work because the the, there's too complicated. You've got, you're talking with broken people who have a lot of trauma, and you know trauma is what creates the drug abuse problem. And so, you, you, in order to create the, the to, con to conquer the drug abuse problem, you have to deal with the trauma first. And so, until you can get them to the point where they can trust you, and so they can start dealing with their trauma, you're going to have a hard time. And just running these, running these people through a, you know the bureaucratic algorithms that they end up having to do, they give up. I mean, I've, I've talked to a homeless man. He's been a, my local homeless man for about 12, 15 years now, I think. How long have I been here? Since, literally since I moved here. He watched my children grow up. And, and we've given him my recycling all, all that time. And we talked to him. He always talks about, you know, I, I keep thinking about coming in, but it's so complicated. He wants so much from you. And I just, I, he just doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to come in because it's too complicated. It's too much and too many restrictions. And he just can't wrap his head around all these things. Life is too complicated for, for some of these people. Yeah. And, when we ha and, it, and it's our responsibility as, as leaders and community members to find a way to help them. And maybe that makes, mean, may, means making life not so complicated. I think maybe that's kind of a goal that we should be kind of forced looking our way towards. Wow, oh, okay. Wow, that, I mean, I, I gotta wrap my head around that. It's really a ser serious issue. Um, you know, and it, 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 what right now it, it, is it more of a? Are they treating this as, it, as an economic issue, or are they just slap throwing under the, under the bus as more of a legal issue, or, or maybe even a, a you know a criminal issue? I mean, what, well, at the, there's so many different ways. Uh, part of the problem is is that they aren't actually treating it as an issue. They're treating it as um, a government department issue, essentially. Right, yes. you get the, the government department of homelessness, and and so they they go through their. I call, we call it, well, I call it, we call it. There's a growing movement that's calling it the homeless industrial complex, <laughs> right? Just like the military yeah. industrial complex, where there are so many people making so much money off of homelessness that in fact there's no real incentive to solve the problem, because they're you know and it's it's not charity groups anymore. It used to be a handful of charity groups who went out and, and helped the homeless people. That's not really what's happening anymore. You now have professional organizations going out and working with the homeless groups. Let's get it back to the churches, and let's get it back to the community groups, and let's get it back to the veterans, the veterans of, uh, groups. Let's get it back into the community, rather than having these faraway bureaucrats and, the, and, and technicians trying to figure this stuff, things out. Because they, they clearly haven't been doing it. It's been getting worse. Well, with, with this trust gro gro uh, growing on through the uh, you know, criminal, criminal justice, uh, justice reform, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, on you know, police accountability and you know, all the, the criminal issues going on? Well, I live in the neighborhood where the distrust among police is growing. No, distrust with the police is, is a growing issue. Um, and so it's, the question is how do we move forward, right? Mm -hmm. How do we, because we all want, we need the police to protect us from predators and we need the police to protect us from, you know, when things get out of hand, you know, people get drunks and emotions run high and, or even sometimes to interject into someone's personal life when you know, emotions and stress, and yeah. someone come out, hey, time out, right? We need someone to come in and tell people, hey, time out, let's figure out what to do, let's get you to some resources. But we've also seemed to lost, we seem to have lost the connection where the police should be actually peace officers, right? Where they use the law to maintain peace, not use the law to engineer society to the way that somebody else wants. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it becomes an industrial complex where they're making money off, off of, uh, 
Right. It's, it's again, where they're more concerned about next year's budget than they are about the people they are actually arresting. You know, if you're arresting some guy because he didn't pay his seatbelt ticket, you know, well, that's not actually helping anybody. It's not helping the guy. It's not helping society. It's you're just so what, what is it you, you would do uh, if, if elected or, or, or what kind of, type of conversation would you be able to have to, that you think that can kind of change this around? Well, the, the first thing you need to do is you need to just increase training. You're going to have to increase the training and from a, what the 30 days, I forget what it is, but you're going to have to at least double the training. Um, I think in Europe they have six months of training. And so we, we should need to increase more training. But before you can do that, you have to decide what are you going to train them in, right? And so we're all talking about increased training. So we'll, we have to sit down and have a conversation. What are we going to train them in? Which means, what do we want our police force to actually look like? And that's not a decision I can make on my own. Do you think that will increase costs by, by increasing training? I mean, do you think that the return uh, in, in, in increased costs is worth it? Well, ultimately, yes. The, sometimes you have to invest in order to save money, right? You know, you have to get some upfront investment in order to save money. But if we don't have, if we have less lawsuits, and we have to pay in the cities and counties, have to pay less money out in lawsuits for police abuses, you know, that money can go into training. If, if we have less people in jail, we don't have to, we don't have to use that money for, to, to fund, to pay for, you know, people in jail. We can use that money so to pay for our training. So yeah. th there is, there is, you know, there, the money is there. I, I, I actually don't accept this notion that we don't have enough money. We don't prioritize our money properly. That is true. Um, well, I mean, besides the training, um, I mean, I, I feel like th th there could be some other ways you can also also tackle this from a, from a maybe a legal perspective. Uh, I mean, may maybe I mean, as far as accountability, um, I mean, police officers are, are, are a lot of times forced to enforce laws that, that they don't want. Is, is there some way that that that, maybe we, that can be changed from the state level? Well, oddly enough. We can, we have to simplify, again, it goes back to simplifying the laws so we can actually all understand them. I mean, we passed, what, 1,100 laws last year? How is, in, how is the average person supposed to even know if they're breaking a law now? I mean, yeah. there's just like 300,000 federal laws, but that's just the laws. That's not the actual regulations and the, and, the, and, the, and the regulations that are enforced as laws. They're literally uncountable. It's literally uncountable how many laws and regulations with the force of law exist. And so one of the first things we can do is just to try to tamp that down. We need to stop with the social engineering. Let's not use the police force to you know, manage straws. If we want to ban plastic straws, we want to, want to prevent plastic straws, well, that's fine, but let's not use the police. Let's not create criminal penalties over plastic straws, right? Let's start creating criminal, pe criminal penalties for every social issue. Instead of criminal penalties, let's say, all right, we, want, we don't want people using plastic straws. So how do we do that without creating? Criminals. Let's not make criminals out of every activity. I, that is the first kind of mindset change we need to make, is that we have to stop creating criminals for everything. We need to decriminalize the whole society. We need to stop with the, the social engineering, right? If we want society to move forward, it has to move forward on its own. We can't engineer it. I've always thought that maybe it would be a good idea that it if we can, if, if we allow officers to make a decision where they don't have to enforce a law where there's no criminal, uh, like a victimless crime, mm -hmm. uh, I think if you give the officers the, the option to not have to enforce those, uh, you, you'll have much better communication with, with uh, you know, police and everything. Because, uh, I mean, pl police officers, I think most people, when they become a police officer, you know, they're doing it for good reasons. I, I wouldn't imagine that, that no one wants to become a police officer just to enforce law. They want to do it to protect people. Uh, I mean, would, do you think you'd be able to incorporate a plan that will allow more freedom to these officers to kind of, uh, you know, do this in a way? Where well, historically, officers did have that freedom. You know, the police officer did have the freedom to choose. You know, I don't have to enforce this law. They actually now they still do in a lot of these cases have the have the freedom to not enforce laws. You know, a police officer sees you driving by down the street five miles an hour with the speed limit, he can choose to pull you over or not. Mm -hmm. It depends upon. Well, what's the, incentive? What, do you think there's an incentive to? Uh, the, for them to be enforcing laws right now? Do you think that, that that's happened? Well, part of the incentive is, the, again, we go back to the budgets, right? If, if they're judged by how many arrests they make or how many tickets they write, well, then they're gonna make arrests and then they're gonna write tickets. So if we need to find a different way for them to judge success. And that's a whole different conversation. I don't have a specific one. That's a long conversation we're gonna have to have with, <laughs> with, with police officers, with community groups, and because no one person is actually going to have the solution to that. That is an insanely complicated okay. question. Well, I mean, as far as a direct plan, uh, 
So what about the about the was you said 1,100 laws last there year? There was a, something like 1,100 new laws last year, and that's just the laws. That's not even the the, the bureaucrats haven't even gotten to them yet to start writing the actual regulations. Yeah, Once, I, don't even, I don't even know 1,100 laws. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and how is anybody supposed to know that if we're we are accountable to them? Do you all. think that maybe if you get elected, you can kind of talk about removing some of those? <laughs> Oddly enough, we're there was a conversation in a, a group for we're, we're I'm in kind of the Nicholas Wildstar for mayor group and. If someone had an idea about a bounty for bad laws. So you put like a $10, $25 bounty, not, not a lot of money, but so every bad law, every bad, stupid law that gets found out you, and gets repealed, the person who found it and who made the case gets their 10, 20 bucks. It's so it's a bad law bounty. That's actually a genius idea. Yeah. Like, it's, <laughs> I'm you know? to take that one, yeah. And so you get, yeah, I'm stealing it now. So um, Elizabeth Stump, we stole your idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a great idea. It's you get people out looking and say, okay, what laws are, are duplicates? Ridiculous, you know, are re duplicate, ridiculous, legal. <laughs> been there for 120 years and no longer is relevant. Well, whatever it is. And so we can simplify this thing. So I we need to have like, expiration dates in these laws. Yeah, sunset. If should every new lobby have a sunset or a date that it needs to be reconsidered, a reconsider date, and that's another actual plan that we should consider. So we don't, because you know, so much changes, especially nowadays. So much changes in five years. You know, we've got even the, in, you know the internet. Five years ago, everybody was talking freely on the internet, and no one cared. And now we're now we have people wanting to regulate the speech on the internet. We had Elizabeth Warren, you know, just the other day, sitting here talking about wanting to make criminal penalties for people who disseminate information, no, misinformation on the internet. Well, how the heck are you going to decide what's misinformation? Yeah, well, who's misinformation? <laughs> Your misinformation or our misinformation? I mean, is the government going to decide? I mean, who's the biggest disseminator of misinformation over the history of the last 50, yeah, you're 70 throw years? Yeah, the whole government in jail. Then the, <laughs> the federal government. It's just crazy. And then, you know, and a lot of this, what it'd be called as disinformation is, you know, opinion. How do you, how do you fact check opinion? That's a whole nother thing, you know. It's, I can agree that climate change and is, is an issue, but you know, it's a, that's actually an opinion. And the, the science of it is complicated, shall we say. I'm not going to say it's not, not clear, it's complicated, but it's all an at, at some point it becomes an opinion. But what to, you know, what to do about it becomes an opinion. So we can say, okay, climate change is real, humans are causing it, so what to do about it? Well, what to do about it, that's an opinion. There is no scientific fact on what to do about yeah. it. And so we have to have the discussion. Okay, so where do we go about it? Do we, do we trust the, the scientists who have their own agendas, whether they mean to or not, you know, mm -hmm. scientists have their own thought process, their own agendas, to, to give, they always seem to have the same solution. It's you give the government more money and more power to solve the problem of climate change. Well, it, those two things, don't, to me, don't seem to necessarily automatically go together, right? You know, yeah, you conflict of interest there, yeah. Yeah, it's maybe we can solve climate change and solve the environmental issues without giving more power and more money to the government. Maybe we can solve it amongst ourselves by simply deciding, you know, maybe I'm only going to take one trip to Disneyland this year instead of three. <laughs> you know, for those of people who fly on, who take plane trips for, for recreation. You know, I'm not going to say cut out all your recreation. We're humans, but can we cut it back? You know, for some of us, can we cut it? Can we be smarter? You know, instead of, instead of flying across to, to New York, maybe we go to Tahoe as for your family vacation instead, yeah. instead of New York, you know, staycation, right? Go to Tahoe inst staycation, instead. Staycation, there you go. <laughs> go to Tahoe instead of, instead of another state. Yeah, those of us in other county will love that. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, we can, we can do things as individuals and we can as a government encourage that, but you know, there's a, there's a saying in the Constitution, you know, the, the government has the right to promote the public welfare. But promote doesn't mean enforce, it means promote. It means you can go out and you tell people uh, hey, it's better if you eat, right? It's better if you live cleaner. It's better if we, if we have, you know, economic development that doesn't destroy the planet. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to, but we don't have to sit there and create all kinds of punishment to, to force people to do that. We don't have to, and even sometimes economic incentives are actually backhanded punishments. We're going to treat you better if you behave this way. Yeah, you than have, you than have the, it was the, the cobra effect. Yeah. yeah. Where was it? Uh, the British government, uh, when it was ruling India, offered a bounty for turning in cobras to reduce cobras. And what ended up happening is people started farming the cobras. And then when they found out people were farming them, uh, they canceled the bounty. And then, and then uh, all the far cobra farmers released all the cobras. Now they have more cobras. Yeah. Well, it also creates a, a strange, and strange economic imbalances, right? We have, if you take a look at, um, at a lot of these, uh, 
Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Renewable uh, energy companies, mm -hmm. right? They, they started with so much, so many subsidies, but when those subsidies finally went away, they couldn't, they weren't sustainable. The companies weren't sustainable. And the part of the problem is not that the business model isn't sustainable, it's the company culture wasn't used to not having that subsidy. They had to work in the, the, the actual free market. They had to uh, depend on the government. Right, and so when that, so when that, that pillar went away, they didn't know what to do. And yep. so they weren't, they weren't flexible enough, they weren't, they weren't used to having to, to think on their feet. And so, and so a lot of those companies just ended up failing. Well, James, I, I think you're the most ethical candidate that, that we can vote for in this election. Um, what is your, your plan to, to, to get your name out there as a writing candidate and, and you know, get, get, your, uh, you know, get, get, pe get people to support you? Well, as a writing candidate, you were, it's a pretty tough task. You have like four or five weeks, essentially. To, to get your ballot, to get on the ballot, qualify for the ballot, get your name out there, and get all and, and get your votes, and again, then get people with votes with ballots out now, right? The election day is a third, but ballots are out now. People are already voting and sending them back in, mm -hmm. and so you have a really condensed time period to to do this. So what we did is we focused on getting our signatures first, then we started to build a campaign, and and then we do in reach. Essentially, we're going to do in reach to the Libertarian Party and to my neighborhood specifically and just work there and trying to hope we get enough votes to push us over the top. Now, I'm particularly lucky. It doesn't look like I'm gonna have an opponent and so I can kind of sneak in without having to do a lot. And so we're really focusing on building our organization for the eight month run to November. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we're focused on. But you know, I've got a lot of other libertarian candidates out there who are, um, who are tr right now trying to kind of put together a write-in campaign effectively and it's tough. I, I tried to do it uh, two years ago, kind of the same thing and it was tough. I didn't make my signatures that, that time. I had, I had a third of my signatures disallowed and we didn't leave ourselves enough time to go back out and fix it. Mm -hmm. and, and so we didn't make the ballot. So this time we, we kind of took a different approach. We hit the signatures hard. We hit them first. We, we, got them, we, we kind of changed our tactics. So we went to a retired neighborhood and we're in the middle of the day. So you know, old people like to answer the door. They like to talk to you and they like to help. And so we, had, and so we got a lot of our signatures that way. Okay, okay. Well, how, how, uh, how do people uh, get more information? Do you have a website up yet? Yeah, you can just for assembly on Facebook. You can go to jjust.us is our is our webpage. It's not actually up yet, but, but we, it'll be it'll be there. It, it'll be you can see the hey this you can see the WordPress is installed and all that kind of stuff. But we actually haven't I haven't I haven't. Do you have, time a, you have an email address that, that we can contact you at? James at jjust.us. There you go. Well, we can we can email you and we can uh, get get involved that way. All right. That is about all the time we have. We would like to thank our guests for appearing. If you would like more information, we can go to libertariancounterpoint.com. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit all the appropriate buttons and you can search for us on your favorite social media platform. From all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, thank you for watching and please remember, love everybody.